my next guest is an optimist. An optimist who is not obsessing about the Fed's dot plots. Refreshing, right? Particularly after coverage this morning. So let's find out why and where he reckons the most opportunities lie. A big welcome to Ausbid, Scott Helstein, Head of Investment Strategy at Global X ETF. Scott, nice to see you. Thank you for having me, Nadine. Okay, so um, why shouldn't we be obsessing about the next rate cut, the month that it comes, and then how quickly we can get another rate cut after? Two words, nominal growth. Because as investors, we should care more about whether the economy is growing and the rate at which it does than the Federal Reserve interest rate decisions. Because at the end of the day, the Federal Reserve is a short-term monetary control mechanism. But what really helps is if we can grow at a fast rate. And we just spent 20 years from 2001 to 2019 growing pretty slowly at 4% nominal growth in the United States. And we had really low inflation. But if we look in the 80s and 90s, we were growing above 6%. And we had inflation around 3%. That was a really good period for investors. So I'm more focused on growth versus rates. And so ultimately, in what I think is the battle of the Fed versus the innovation economy, the innovation economy keeps winning. Okay, so the innovation economy, I would assume you mean all of the enthusiasm about the mega cap tech names, a lot of which has been inspired by AI as of late. But don't you think it's looking a little bit toppy in that end of the market? Well, if we go back to toppy in the dot-com days, the U.S. S&P 500 tech sector was selling at 70 times price to forward earnings. The market itself, the S&P 500, at 30 times. Today, the tech sector is selling at 30 times and the S&P is at 20 times. So I would actually argue, rather than be toppy, given what we're seeing with margin expansion and business efficiency across the economy, it might actually be the 20 times on the S&P 500 is a new floor for valuation because valuation we know over 70 years has moved higher over time. And what does it follow? Margins. If businesses can be more efficient in delivering cash, we should have to pay more for them. And that's okay. So looking at this chart, you're saying that we're not, we're not, you know, year 2000, 1999. This does, not feel, not happening. this does not feel to me like it's partying like it's 1999. Those of us who, a certain vintage of us who started our careers right around that time, it was a very formative experience living through the end of the dot-com boom and the bust. Um, but we're not, we're not in that environment now. And the internet evangelicals at the time were right. The internet changed everything. We just didn't have the infrastructure, nor did we have consumers that were ready to use it at the time. AI isn't a consumer-led innovation. AI is going to be based on corporate ad adoption. And there's an infrastructure that corporations already have across enterprise software, cloud computing, data connectivity, that they're going to be able to leverage to roll out. So I actually think that there's a lot more ahead when it comes to margin expansions and efficiency for particularly large cap US companies. OK, so you don't think that. Um you know, you referenced multiples, you referenced, um, you know, 20. You, like, how does those multiples continue to be justified? So, again, if we think about uh, what margins have done, we've now had 13 straight quarters with profit margins for the S&P 500 that were above 12%. We've never seen that before. If we want to go back in time, in the 1950s, for a decade, profit margins averaged 6%. And then fast forward to the teens, 70 years later, they averaged 9%. It took us 70 years to pick up three percentage points, but in the last four, we've just picked up another three. So we've compressed 70 years of efficiency into four years. And so at the time, by the way, multiples in the 50s were averaging around 10 and they go up to about 18 in the teens. Uh -huh. So there could be, if this 3%, if we're gonna see margins at 12, 13, 14%, we could see valuations at 24, 25 times, and that's gonna be the new normal. And that's justified. And that would be justified. Okay, um, so when we think about everything that needs to go right with this AI thematic, with this uh, margin expansion, with this productivity increase, um, 
you know, what is it? Because we just had Apple the other day saying they are going to put AI in the hands of consumers. We've got a lot of um, a lot of unknowns when it comes to exactly how AI will be used, not just to do you know funny little things, but to actually help improve the earnings of companies, and not just you know of those that are creating the AI, but of those in which are actually using it. Yeah, it really is about the deployment to the end user. And mind you, this is going to take some time. We're in the very early innings. There's a lot that's written about it. We've seen some of these stocks that are related, obviously, NVIDIA, Microsoft with OpenAI. Some of those story stocks, we've seen those work pretty well. But there's a much broader ecosystem around hardware, software, and data. So we'll continue to build out the hardware. The software will continue to improve. We'll continue to build up data sets based on sensors and low intensity chips and the internet of things and connectivity, all of which is going to feed in. And many companies are still piloting programs in different areas, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, and they're looking for very particular ways to extract efficiencies. So I don't think AI is a one-two company. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all. I don't think it's, it's one to software that will ultimately dominate the system. It's going to be about discovering where it works best. And again, early innings. So currently, I, there's a, a forecast out there that there could be, in 10 years, $16 trillion of global cost savings. That would be monumental. Companies would be phenomenally profitable. If we even get a fraction of that, say 10%, that could still drive large cap margins another eight or 10 points higher than they already are. So keep in mind, we've had this margin expansion off of di uh, investment in automation and digitalization that doesn't even include AI. So there is gonna be a discovery period. This is not gonna immediately impact, but I would say over 12 to 24 months, we will see large cap companies adopting it, and then it's gonna move down the cap structure. Large cap companies have more people and more money to experiment. And so then it'll go to mid cap, and then it'll go to small cap. So there is a period where uh, we're gonna to have to live with a little bit of uncertainty, but I don't think it's gonna be anything like the decade long build out that we saw with the dot com and the internet. So if you just can explain this chart that's on screen now for us and how that relates to those companies that are outside just the mega cap mm -hmm. names. So the story that I actually really like here is John Deere. They're a tractor company. Well, they've also arguably won the automated driving race because John Deere tractors drive around the fields of the United Central mm -hmm. United States 24 hours a day, taking samples, uh, harvesting, seeding, uh, tilling, and they're supported by a network of drones that are taking readouts and oxygen, temperature, identifying healthy and unhealthy crops. Therefore, um, those in the agricultural businesses, they don't need to spray an entire field with pesticide or entire field with fertilizer. They can target the areas where they need uh, to, to try and enhance the mm -hmm. yield. Um, and it's all supplied, supported by a network of proprietary satellites. So, is John Deere a tractor company or are they a technology company that happens to make tractors? That to me is the efficiency. And so we're even seeing it in areas, for example, like insurance and construction inspection, where instead of going up to four roofs a day, building inspectors can fly drones overhead and take pictures. Then they have algorithmic software that can combine them into a common, uh, a, a common image and then can scan and look for anomalies or problems so that it is not taking the place of the human, but it is supporting and enhancing the work that they're doing. And I think that that's true across the economy. So really that chart that you would put up on margins yeah. is about that story of where these little things are going to add up to make a big difference and help to push profit margins higher. Mm -hmm. And if you look historically, there's nothing that concerns you in this chart. And so if I'm an investor sitting at home, the line we always try to draw is, if I don't own NVIDIA, my opportunity is not lost? It is not lost. Um, Global X has a, a basket of stocks uh, in uh, an artificial intelligence fund that is uh, GXAI, and uh, there are 90 companies that are involved in software, hardware, and data. Um, 
It, so like the picks and shovels? It is the picks and shovels. It is the people that are on the first line trying to develop the systems and monetize them for the rest of the economy. So we see hardware first, we see software second, we see the benefits across the economy third. Yeah, and so looping it around, bringing it you know, back to the center, that is why you're not concerned about the U.S. economy, a policy misstep coming from the Fed, or is that still a possibility? Well, it is a possibility. I thought that they waited actually quite some time before removing the word transitory back a couple of years ago when they were talking about inflation. And I do think that, for the record, the last mile is going to be the hardest. We just got the CPI number. It came in a little bit better than expected at 3.3 relative to 3.4. We have PPI obviously coming out, producer prices coming out uh, uh, this morning in the United States. But I'm okay with 3% inflation as long as I can get 6% nominal growth. That's a really good environment for investors. And I ultimately think everything we're talking about, the AI, the automation, digitalization, that's going to drive corporate investment. And that's the piece that's been missing. When we in the United States have been off on our economic forecast the last few years, it's because we have underestimated the impact of companies spending money in these new technologies. And so I'm a really big believer that we are going to see companies continue to accelerate that spend. And that is actually going to be the underappreciated aspect of why we could see above trend growth in the United States, irrespective of what the Fed does with its rates. Yeah, but that's the big end. What about the mid to actually small end in the United States? If the Fed can be patient, if the Fed can sit back and not do much, you know, are we creating a problem down at the or is a rising tide going to lift all boats in the true American way? I believe it's the latter. As of right now, if we're talking concrete, we look at high yield credit spreads, yep. which is what is sensitive to rates in that mid and smaller level. We're not seeing those risk levels blow out. Mm -hmm. They're very contained. Um, and uh, uh, across the board, uh, I think that there is opportunity for a lot of these companies to, to benefit. and. The difference between 5%, 5.5% is not necessarily what's going to tip the economy. The last three times the Fed cut, 2000, 2007, 2020, it was all in response to crises, dot-com, mortgages, and then COVID. We should be celebrating the fact that the Fed can kind of sit back, put its feet up on the desk, and say, you know what? We can be patient here because the economy can work.